Hi, we're Richard and Jackie from Early Retirement Wonderlust. If you've been watching our videos over the summer, you will know that we've had a pretty epic summer of camper van adventures. We have had three big trips, one to the southwest of England, one to Alpine Europe and one to Shetland and the Orkney Islands. In our last video, we decided that we would put out for questions about those trips to the early retirement community. And you've been fantastic. So we are about to embark on our first ever question and answer session. So as Richard said, we have come to the end of an epic summer of adventures and in our last video we did ask if there was any questions people had about the planning and how we went about sorting out these trips and we were blown away with how many questions you've actually asked us. So rather than sitting and typing lots of answers, which we normally do, we thought we'd just give this a go and without further ado we'll get going. Yeah, and it feels really grown up. It feels like we've sort of come of age as part of YouTube because this is what you're meant to do on YouTube but we feel like... A little bit uncomfortable doing it, but I've got a spreadsheet of questions and we'll go from have. there. So, uh, Suzanne Simple Living asks, um, I'd love to go to the Shetland Islands, but we have a large motorhome. Do they take large vehicles on the boats and at the campsites? And I think it's probably linked to some questions from Alison Bennett and Leanne Arnold. That's to do with just general use of motorhomes on you know, the outlying islands. Um, so, first of all, the motorhomes to Shetland. There were a couple on the ship that we took from Aberdeen. Uh, not many, though. Um, I think possibly to do with the cost. We got away with being almost classed as a large car, so it wasn't that expensive compared to the bigger vehicles. Um, the roads in Shetland in particular were actually really good because they apparently were built as part of the oil industry. So Shetland itself getting around isn't an issue. And we did see and stay at a couple of campsites where there would be no problems. I think as you get to the smaller islands like Unst, Yell and Fetler, the roads got a little bit narrower and a bit more twiddly. So I think it's a, a bit of common sense and a bit of where you want to go. But yeah, it is doable. And we th we certainly saw a lot more motorhomes on the Orkney Islands, didn't we? And mm. I think that's probably because it's a little bit more accessible. It's a shorter ferry, so obviously it's maybe a slightly cheaper ferry for big vans. But ironically, I think some of the roads there were a little bit more twiddly. And yeah. I certainly wouldn't want to be driving a huge van around. We did see... Uh, Rosie the Overlander and how on earth they drove that around there I do not know so next question um, Magzadam20 do you buy souvenirs from your travels especially as you lead a less is more approach to stuff um, oh gosh we don't particularly buy many souvenirs we do tend to pick up the odd ones like if we see any love heart stones on the beaches or very pretty little pebbles we might bring them back actually this time from Shetland we did buy ourselves a piece of artwork because we'd seen it and it would fit into one of the photo frames that uh, Rich's dad had made for us we don't very often buy souvenirs and if they are they're just little things yeah and it's things that sort of like jog your memory um, but there is nothing better than a few pebbles and we have got a little pebble collection and we could pretty much name where they've all come from because they're quite distinctive and that's all you really need because you've got your memories of all these amazing places you go to. I suppose there is also the odd little thing like we might buy an Oppenol cheese knife when we're in France but we keep it in the van and it's something that we'll use so I suppose if we do buy anything it's mindful and it's something that we want to use in the van or in the house. Okay I'll have a go at this one. Um, Paul and Paul and Alex ask, uh, what are your key tips and thoughts for the transition from short trips in your van up to 10 days while working full time to longer trips in early retirement that like we've been doing six to eight weeks? Um, I don't think there's a massive amount of difference. Um, you, certainly when you're on the longer trip, what we've found hard to transition to is a more sort of slower pace of travel. Um, when we were limited for time and we were working, we tended to go at like a breakneck speed. And we, at times we were guilty of not fully immersing ourselves in areas. 
And then I vividly remember we had that like transition holiday, didn't we, where we just went to the French Alps and limited yeah. ourselves to there. But yeah, we tend to just try and focus and stay in an area and explore it to death and then in a few days or maybe a week's time move on. And we don't tend to pack any more or any less if we're going on a longer or shorter trip. Um, we do take quite a minimal amount of stuff with us anyway, so don't think it makes a huge amount of difference to what we pack in the van. We are doing a video shortly on the difference between holidays and travel and that might seem like a really small difference but for us it's a massive mindset thing and you know we're heading off with the kids to Florida for a holiday and it's going to be very very different to everything that we've done this summer which was traveling and living on the road so look out for that video on its way. Um, this was definitely one for you Jackie from uh, Frugal Mr B. What apps would you recommend for finding camping spots and that's it. Oh, okay. Um, so the main go-to app that we use is Park for the Night. I keep saying Park for the Night. It's actually Park for Night. Um, it's a great free app and it will tell you lots of hidden places and lots of different kinds of car parks and it'll tell you if they've got facilities or not. Um, and it also includes most of the campsites as well, which is why we use it the most. Um, in conjunction with that, we do use Google Maps to search for campsites particularly and then um, occasionally I will also use search for sites because that has now started listing some of the campra um, campsites that are popping up and actually more recently just this summer we started using the camper rally, campra rally Facebook page because that's been set up this summer which has a list if you search deep enough of all of the new airs that have been set up in the UK and that's really handy there's just so many on there and a great Facebook page. And when you're traveling off season use the Axi app which is really good because it takes the old massive books and puts it into an app and you can search I think pretty much by price as well can't you on that? because we're a bit cheapskate and go for the cheaper sites. But Yeah, he means the Axie card that you use in Europe. You don't use that one in England. Okay. <laughs> um, Frugal Mr B then adds, um, what are your views on solar, panel, uh, solar panels, a necessity or not? Um, I think they are a necessity. We started off with a really basic solar panel on our van. It was one of the super thin ones that was just stuck to the van roof. Um, and to be fair... <laughs> that blew off actually um, on one of our first trips which was not great um, and then it never really worked thereafter so we went to a solid panel and once we did that and then upped our battery bank to 220 amp hours I think that's correct um, we've never looked back and we can go off grid pretty much as long as we want in the summer. Yeah we've been off grid or we've certainly not had to use electric hookup for over a week at a time if we are somewhere in the summer and it's light nights and the solar just charges everything really well. The only time we actually need to go to a campsite for electricity is to charge our laptops, which is something very specific. Okay, Natalie Wilcox Lindsay, 9153. What camera do you use for taking photos? Okay, I'll start. Most of our photos are taken on our iPhones and they're not new fancy ones. They're just iPhone 11 Pros. We've had them for four or five years. Um, We've got used to looking at different lighting conditions and better at taking what Richard keeps calling properly composed photos. But yeah, it's taken on an iPhone 11 Pro, most of them. And from back in the day when Georgia was pole vaulting, we invested in quite a cheap DSLR camera, a Nokia 3100. Or even a Nikon. Oh, <laughs> a Nikon 3100 and I don't think you can get it anymore um, it's just dropped off the bottom of the range um, you could probably get it second hand but it was for like less than 500 quid and we do all our wildlife photography with that because we've got a 300 millimeter lens again quite a cheap Tamron lens 300 millimeter it's really good for our purposes um okay so we had probably no surprises here, quite a lot of questions <laughs> about our toilet arrangements in a small VW van. So Liz Zilly, Jennifer Maud and Carl Cunningham all in various ways dodged around the subject of what do we do about toilets in the van. So should we address this again? 
Yeah, it is quite a common question we get whenever we've been away on a trip. Um, obviously, the VW doesn't have any onboard facilities. Half the time, we're on campsites. Obviously, no issue with that. When we were in Scotland, interestingly, on the last trip on Shetland and Orkney, um, very, very good set of community toilets and um, public toilets. And actually, most of the time when we could park up for the night, we were within walking distance of those facilities. So that wasn't an issue at all. Um, Occasionally, if we are really out in the wilds, we're just not opposed to a wild wee. But we do make sure that we leave it at a wild wee. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to use Carl Cunningham's quote. Uh, what do you do for number twos? Uh, our number twos just for campsites. And yeah, yeah. I, it's just, it drives us mad when you look and you go out into the great outdoors and people leave mess around and you know there's absolutely no excuse for that seven years of camper vanning we've never felt the need to do anything like that and there's always public loos calves pubs or campsites around and that's sort of sad really yeah let's get on to a uh, a more riveting topic shall we say um jill chu talks about um does the van feel claustrophobic when the weather takes a turn for the worst um, and you have to spend more time hunkered down. I actually quite like it when we have the odd inclement weather day because it does mean we can slow down and I just get the bed and the duvet out and I either sit and read or I will watch just rubbish TV. Um, I don't think it feels claustrophobic. We've had some pretty mental nights and days in the van where <laughs> storms have been coming through, particularly in the north of Scotland and on, on the islands. Um, and it's really good. It's really exciting. It does sort of wear off after three or four days of it. And when we were in Slovenia, we knew that we'd got a two day storm coming, but it was okay, wasn't it? Yeah, and any more than that, I think we try and move on and dodge the weather. So if we know there's a really bad weather front coming through, we'll try and drive through it so that we're not stuck in really bad weather. So no, it doesn't bother us too much. I, we actually see it as a positive. Um, I'll have a crack at this one. Nigel WCC4069. At what point will you consider updating your camper and what sort of vehicle would you go for next time? Well, we started the looking process last year and we went to the NEC camper van show for the first time and we had our eyes opened really because we didn't know what we didn't know. And now we've got an idea of the sort of spec that we're after and we're going to go back this October and try and have a look at probably three or four different vans in real detail. Yeah, so we very specifically know that we are probably going to get a van that's not actually that much bigger, um, a Fiat Ducato 5 meter 40 van, which does allow it to have onboard facilities, which um, I still don't think we would use massively. Um, but at least they will be there because it opens up us being able to use airs, particularly when we're in Europe. Um, we want a van that has got a fixed bed at the back, um, mainly so that I can just loll about when it's raining and wet and Richard can have the front bit with the dinette area to himself. We have seen a couple of models that have a um, pop top roof still, even though the Fiat Ducato is taller so we can stand up in that van yeah. compared to the VW. Uh, we weren't considering a pop top on the new van but actually it makes it into a full berth our children are knocking on for their 30s they may start thinking about children it just would give us that flexibility that we could still use the new van and have little people in it as well wow <laughs> how do i answer that um yeah i'd love to to go for um a sprinter style van but when we actually looked at them at the show we were quickly switched off and they just felt really quite narrow and you know i'm six foot and it's a bit of a squeeze to sleep sideways and i think jackie said that you know we can't we can't fit anything more than a five and a half meter van around the back of our house yeah so. that's where the five and a half meters comes from we've got a very tight stone wall dry stone wall that you cannot get round in anything much bigger than five and a half meters six meters so yeah we do quite specifically know what we want now and what we definitely don't want. And on the size wise, it does come down to truly how we like our travel as well. Um, and some of the places we go, I would not, I, I wouldn't be confident taking anything more than, you know, a five and a half meter van to the places that we go, because I want to be able to get in safely and get out. So 
that's what we're comfortable with. And I know other people will have different views on that. There is um, one more thing that we definitely do want is a garage underneath it rather than bench seats at the back, which I know would convert into um, a bed nicely. But um, we're a bit fed up with the VW. Whenever we go travelling, the, the middle of the van is just rammed full of stuff. And if we could have a garage underneath the bed, so the bed will be quite high and it looks a bit tidier when we're travelling, that would be nice. Okay. I'm going to do this quick one because then there's one teed up for Jackie. Um, two people, Lisa Alder and Highwayman, asked what time frame do we do our videos in? And people were sort of like guessing when we went to uh, Shetland and the Orkney Islands. Um, we actually went in the height of summer, which is very much unlike us. Um, since we've been early retired, we decided that we were going to try and travel sort of off peak really because we get more bang for our buck um, and we came back to the Dales last summer and it was the wettest summer on record so we purposely decided that this year we were going to go off somewhere granted we chose to go as far north as you can in the UK and we absolutely looked out with the weather so yeah we were there um, in July and early August we don't always do our trips like that. We don't always have a lag on the videos, um, but it just really sort of depends how we've scheduled stuff um, and how it fits in and how much stuff we've got to put out there, really, which is exactly why Jack is really good for this next question <laughs> from Ivan Oaks. Uh, please, can you do a video that shows how you plan out your trips, book your ferries and get best value? So basically, how do we organize our trips and how do we get inspiration for our trips? I don't know why he thinks I'm the best person to answer that. Um, we have actually done planning videos for a couple of the different trips that we've been on. So when we went to Europe, we did um, show um, some of the planning process and what we packed to take away with us. Um, but yeah, I suppose it is videos that we could do in the future. Um, in terms of how we do it, we, we have a sort of endlessly growing bucket list of where we want to go. We take inspiration from YouTube, from Instagram. Um, we know exactly sort of the areas of the world that we want to go to. Um, and then we just do the research like everyone else. So, you know, we'll we'll have a look at Google. We, we've got a couple of favorite books that we use, haven't we? I know people probably get fed up with us talking about the wild guide books, but they are just so fantastic, particularly in the UK. Um, we plan a lot of our Scottish trips, particularly around the Scottish Wild Guide book. Um, we've got the Welsh one, we've got the Lake District and Yorkshire Dales one. And actually one of the best Wild Guide books that we used for inspiration was the French Alps Guide, which was just amazing. Some of the places that took us to, we would never have found. And within those guides, there is something for everyone. So, you know, we, we like our history, we like our walking, we like our climbing, our wild swimming. The, the way the books are broken down, it, it sort of tees it all up for us. And uh, yeah, they're sort of inspirational for us, really. And then actually, another big thing that we get our inspiration from is talking to travellers that we meet along our journeys. So sometimes we might just sit on a campsite chatting away to people from, I don't know, the Netherlands or Germany, and they will tell us about different parts of where they're from. And we've visited quite a few places that have just been on recommendations from fellow travellers. Okay, so where are we up to? Um, Deborah Griggs, what do we do to maintain our van in good running order and prepare for any mechanical issues or mishaps? Well, what we certainly don't do is rely on Richard's skills to get us out of mechanical disasters or mishaps. He has no skills. That's just not going to happen. So um, we get the van serviced regularly. We get it serviced at a local garage where we used to live and we've got a really good relationship with the guy there and he does an amazing job on an annual basis. So we take it back there for its service and its MOT and we try to time that just prior to our big summer trips. So it would be sort of April time, is that right? right? Yeah, Maybe. well, no, I think it's probably, uh, yeah, April, May. Um, I know when we went to Europe twice in the winter, we did have a little bit of an extra service just before Christmas because we knew we were going to be doing two trips down to the French Alps. But yeah, generally, we just make sure we keep it up. Uh, we make sure the cam belt's been changed whenever it's needed. It's according to its service log. 
Um, something that you changed this time when we went to Europe was the tyres. Yeah, we went. We needed to change the tyres anyway, and we've always run the van on commercial tyres like it's meant to be run because it, they run really efficiently, and the van is designed to run on tyres like that. But we decided to take the plunge, having moved to the Dales, um, which is a little bit more rural, um, and we were wanting to go for longer time to Europe to not necessarily go for winter tyres, but to go for all season tires and this was on the recommendation of a guy down in town and they have been just brilliant you don't need to change them i don't know whether it's psychosomatic or not but i feel a lot safer driving on them and i feel a lot more secure they've kept the tread really well and we are going to continue using them um, if i can think on when i'm editing this i will dig out what make of tires we use but they're excellent and yeah it's a big game changer we also have vw assist and we have since we got the van um vws are renowned for engine warning lights and things like that we don't get too many of those but in the early days when we were having a few problems with engine warning lights vw assist were brilliant and for the hundred and odd quid a year it costs for that it's a peace of mind knowing that we covered in the UK and in Europe, wherever we're driving. Okay, I'll like this one. Um, Susan McKee, did you find Shetland and Orkney very different from the Outer Hebrides? And which on balance did you prefer? Oh, that is a really, really tough question because I love the Outer Hebrides. The beaches on the Outer Hebrides are just probably the best in the world I think until I went to Shetland and we weren't expecting it to be as beautiful as it was um, and I think it had the edge for me over the Outer Hebrides because it's so quiet so we pretty much in the middle of summer had most places on Shetland to ourselves. Both sets of islands I think are really welcoming and they're really well set up in terms of community facilities mm. and we really like that. A community facility or an honesty box facility that a local farmer set up, you just can't beat it because you genuinely feel that you are putting back into the local community. So both sets of islands are really good for that. Um, we've never been to the Outer Hebrides in peak season, have we? Yeah. Um, we've only ever travelled there, we've done a couple of winter trips and... I think it was a, a spring or an autumn but never in the height of summer and we're aware from on the forums there's some quite strong feelings at the moment about um, the number of vans that are allowed on to the outer hebrides and things like that we've not witnessed it firsthand so we can't really comment on it but um yeah i for me probably just the wildness of shetland took it for me but it's obviously a lot further away. And the puffins. I mean, the fact that you could go to the Shetland, get off the ferry and within half an hour be down at Sunberhead and there are puffins dancing around your feet was just amazing. Um, I think we were also very lucky when we were on Shetland because we had the best weather. We were there for two weeks and we had one day of rain, a bit of a windy spell, but the rest of it was wall-to-wall -wall sunshine and it was beautiful. Okay. One not to do with travel, but... We thought we'd have a crack at this one. Uh, Rebecca Green, I wondered if you'd wished you had retired even early and knowing what you've now experienced since retiring early. Shall I have a go or do you want yeah, to have a go? Yeah, you can have a go. Um, we'd always planned to early retire at the age of 55 and everything that we were doing was building towards that. And then you all know, because we've documented it on this channel, that in 2021 we had a, just the most horrific year where I lost my dad and I lost my younger brother um, in quick succession and it just caused us to reevaluate our lives and we, we looked at the maths and we realised that life is too short and life is precious and we worked out that we could just about do it to survive until we were 55 so we made that decision to retire then um, a little bit earlier than when we can get our pension at 55 and I don't think we would have planned to go before and even now knowing what we know I don't think we would have really if it wasn't for that traumatic moment would have made the decision to go earlier. No I think we would have gone till we're 55. Um... Yeah, for me, the way that we have funded being able to early retire is that we sold our house in Cheshire and we downsized to our house in the Yorkshire Dales. We love our little cottage in the Dales, but it did release a lot of equity that we've been using to help us survive until we get our pension. 
if you'd done that any earlier, we just couldn't have afforded to do that. And actually, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying the time that we're having now. I think it would probably almost be greedy to have even longer because we really have released a really good amount of time, quality time for us to do what we want to do. Yeah, and there's always going to be that balance. And I think if you look to go any sooner, I think the financial compromises that you're making there for the rest of your retirement is probably too great. I think 55 would have been ideal for us. I think we're just right on the cusp now. And, you know, we're really grateful for, you know, some of the extra income we get through writing and this YouTube stuff that just helps us along the way in terms of our travels. But it would have been too tight yeah. to go earlier on. And we wouldn't have wanted to do that. Yeah, it's been tight enough as it is. <laughs> it is, yeah. Um, Mike and the Boys asks, uh, what other tours do we have planned? Well, so we are at the end of our summer tours for now. And actually, um, our next two trips aren't in the camper van. We are going to Florida as a family trip, um, as a holiday for two weeks, which we're really looking forward to. And we have got a big trip planned to Thailand. So again, not in the camper van because we can't get it there. Um, our next big tour will be skiing again. Yeah, so we were excited about that. We really enjoyed our sort of half season of <laughs> being ski bums last year. Um, we're not going to do it for any longer, but we are going out for a good old ski in uh, early ski season um, out to the French Alps, which mm -hmm. we're really looking forward to. Um, and I think the only other thing that we've got booked in at the moment is that it's highly likely next summer that we're looking to go and do northern Spain um, perhaps a little bit of northern Portugal and then back up to the Pyrenees um, all tagged around the long ferry trip down yeah, I'm right in thinking I think so um, there's other things on the bucket list there's Norway <laughs> and Scandinavia but that has to wait I think till we get a slightly bigger van and uh, we've got a bit more time to be able to do that and we get our pension so we've actually got an income coming in well you know that will help uh, seen as from what we believe Norway is meant to be really expensive so yeah that's going to take some quite careful planning but that's going to be a monster trip but sometime in the future yeah it's a trip that we want to do three months on definitely not just a six-week trip probably linked with that uh Geese5383 asks, are you still on budget with all of these trips? <laughs> um, actually, when we get away in the camper van, the trips are not as expensive as they may seem. Um, when we went to Europe this summer, we were away for just over six weeks. And in total, with absolutely everything, with all of the ferries, with all of our petrol, tolls, living expenses, campsite fees, we spent about £2,700, which still sounded quite a lot to me but when you think about our monthly budget it actually wasn't too much over and we do have a slush fund now luckily from magazine writing and from what we earn through YouTube that we do have as a specific holiday pot which tends to pay for big things like the, the big ferries when we went to Shetland. Yeah so once we've got those sort of big costs out of the way which comes from our travel pot that I suppose we're probably earning now yeah. um rarely do we go over we have a we've talked a lot about cash is king and we try and keep our weekly living expenses um that includes food fuel and a whole host of other things to about 200 pounds so if we can be somewhere in that ballpark figure when we're away um that works really well i think we might just take a break there because it's jackie's mum calling so we'll uh, we'll get back to you in a minute so the next question how was your mum <laughs> she's fine she's very excited about going to florida <laughs> right we yeah okay let's move on um claire boyland 6741 asks what are your favorite go-to meals oh gosh um you've probably seen us cook a lot of over the years um a tomato -y pasta type dish we tend to have a lot of pasta because we're always out hiking and busy yeah and it, it definitely goes seasonally so in the winter we definitely stodgy <laughs> ricey potato -y pasta type stuff um but we do try to cook fresh sauces don't we yeah and then in the summer just with Jackie's South African heritage it has to be meat on the barbie and then variety of salads and stuff but yeah I think we always try and eat well on the road it's part of what we do. Our path unseen 
One thing that bothers us about Scotland is the midges or mosquitoes. Did you have any problems with them? Actually, we were really surprised on Shetland and Orkney. Um, we thought we would have more problems with them because we were there in July and August, but we only had maybe two nights in the whole four weeks. Um, and that was where we were slightly more inland and um, the, the wind had really dropped. So we haven't had any issues. But what an insight <laughs> those two two days yes. were, my life. We'd never been to Scotland in the summer because I am just bug bait um, <laughs> and I get eaten alive. So, um, yeah, those those two sessions, it was just wild, wasn't it? Yeah, not something I would want to come across too often, I must admit. So, yeah, always go to where the breeze is and uh, just be aware. Sunrise and sunset, it gets particularly nasty at times. Chris Mack asks... Do you pre-book campsites, phone ahead, or just turn up and hope for the best? We very rarely book any more pre-book um, because I don't like being limited to where we're going to go. Again, we said earlier, if the weather's not great, if we haven't booked anywhere, we can just head further south or head north or just go to a completely different place. Um, there are occasions like this summer we wanted to go to Lake Bled where we did pre-book about four days ahead just to make sure we definitely could get a spot there because we'd seen on the forums it was busy, um, but not very often. No, and I think it's been an evolution over mm. like six years. When in our first trips, planaholic myself, you know, I just could not cope with the prospect of even just one night unsure of where we were going to go. And we soon realised that that was just too restrictive and we didn't have the freedom to explore. So... You do need to remember we do travel predominantly in the off season as well. If we were going in the height of summer into Europe, we'd definitely book. Yes, we would actually, particularly if it was um, a high touristy destination like Annecy, um, Chamonix. Although Chamonix, you can't pre-book, which <laughs> is another story in itself. Yeah, on certain campsites, you just have to turn up and wait and in the morning and hope that there is space. And that's not a nice feeling. So we try and avoid that as well. But Travelling off-season, you tend to get away with just going with the flow, really. Um, and then the last question from Jan L7552. About your longer trips, how do you manage the storage and provisions during that time? So we're in a small van. How do we manage to get everything in? Um, as I said earlier, we don't actually take a huge amount extra on longer trips so probably no different to we, we pack what we pack whether we're going for a weekend or longer I suppose it's just a few more clothes in the boot and I just ram it in and shove the door shut we do have a couple of crates when we're going on super long trips that we have in the van and that they just slide underneath the van so that can be for things that are non-perishable or um not particularly valuable yeah. or anything like that they just go under the van every time we stop and no one cares to steal them. So that's okay. That's fine. And we just had one more question that came through while I was actually on the FaceTime with my mum from Peter and Miriam asking, do I drive when we go on any of our longer trips? Um, the answer is probably not very often. I can drive the van and I will drive it um, on bigger motorways. I don't particularly drive it around the Orchard Dales because I don't like the narrow roads, <laughs> but I can drive it. If push came to shove, I would have to. I've never driven it abroad though. But you do dig me out of some holes because I am notoriously bad for getting sleepy um, and particularly on motorways in the UK. So Jackie is quite happy to take a hit for that aren't you and you're actually much better at that long distance driving yeah. than I am because I'm just sleepy head yeah so if we went up to Scotland we would just share the driving and I would just do a two or three hour stint not bothered about that so that's about it we didn't really know how we were going to play this and we're hoping to do it in as a, as few cuts as possible just to try and uh, just be a little bit more you know, real in terms of what we're doing. It's been really lovely answering all your questions. It's been really thought provoking. Yeah, so we've really enjoyed our 2024 summer season of adventures. We've got lots more coming up um, that you'll find out about in the future. So that's it for now. Bye. See you. Bye. <laughs>